Okay. So um, th thank you very much. Welcome, Carol Altman, with two ends on the end. Yes. Um, we'll have a look at your current work website uh, in a minute. I'll share the screen, but maybe you can start off by telling us about yourself um, as a person and journalistically maybe a bit of a bio. Sure. Well, um, just a really brief bio is I started off where I've ended up, funnily enough, in Warrnambool um, as a cadet here in the local newspaper when it was in its probably looking back in its prime. And from there, most of my career was spent in Adelaide with News Limited, uh, working on the Suburbans and then, you know, you work your way up through News Limited if you're lucky. And so uh, <laughs> if you're not, <laughs> whichever the case might be. Um, but yeah, so I was I just did the classic, you know, through the Suburbans, then into the Adelaide Advertiser. And I was lucky enough to get into the Australian, which was really the, uh, for me at the time, the pinnacle of journalism. I really was thrilled to be part of that and ended up uh, working for them uh, down in Hobart as well in Tasmania as the sole operator for the Australian there. So an entire state, which was interesting. <laughs> and I learned very quickly that people in Sydney don't really have a concept of how big Tasmania is when you're a sole operator. So I really got to know that state very well by driving around here and there. But and then so they, they ring you in Hobart and say, go to Launceston this morning or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or worse, pop up, pop up, Bernie. <laughs> you know where Bernie is? It's like driving from Sydney to Brisbane. <laughs> it, not in distance, in terms of time, you know, and the yeah, road. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, it's only that far on the map. It's only so that, that far on the map, yeah. How long did all of that take? You, you talked about going from, um, I assume, a cadetship in, mm -hmm. in locals to... Yeah getting to be the foreign correspondent from Tasmania <laughs> on the Oz. Uh, yes. How long did that take? Oh, I'm thinking that's probably a trajectory about oh, 20, probably, um, well, I could probably work that too. So probably about 24 years, something like that. It's quite a long period of time. It's half my lifetime. It is, it is. It takes a while. It takes 24 years to become an overnight success. Yes. And, and what, um, what, what was it that allowed you, you said some people don't, you know, make that progress through the media company, this case, News Corp. What, what was it that you were doing right um, when you started out in journalism that allowed you to, you know, succeed where you were and then progress? Mm. Um, that's a really good question because at the time, um, and we sort of forget this, there was still uh, a lot of that sort of traditional role model stuff going on in journalism as well, where the women did the soft stories, you know, women did the fashion mm. and they did the you know, the, the colour stories and, and the bit, the, mostly the blokes did the politics. So for me, it was a bit, of a bit of a double thing because not only did I manage to make my way through that, but I also managed to make my way through it into politics, which was um, interesting. Yeah. How I did that, I think, was by being particularly annoying and just asking all the time if I could join in and I'd ask questions of the political reporters because I knew nothing about politics. I mean, I'd come from Warrnambool, which, you know, it's it wasn't a particularly political place. You know, we have, mm. we still have pretty much a one party system. <laughs> We're still a blue ribbon uh, little town. So I didn't really mm. have any, any real interest in politics other than once I got into journalism, I realized that that's sort of where the excitement was, you know, and, um, mm. and, and the, the front page stories. So I think it was persistence and curiosity. And once sounds probably a bit cliched, but once I got an opportunity to, to work in that area, um, I literally worked extremely hard. You know, you just have mm. to put in the, the effort and the hours and the, you learn not to say no. You learn to say, yes, I'll, you know, I'll do that or I'll give that a try or I'll, I'll, I'll press my comfort zone a little. Those sort of mm. things really, I think they make you stand out a little bit um, as someone who's, you know, keen, um, happy, to, happy to try anything. And that was my reputation, I think, was that I was, uh, it's funny because, Leaping way forward. That's where I got my my nickname, the Terrier, right back then. Oh, when, when exactly? When I when? when I was working in Adelaide, trying to get into the political foray for the advertiser, um, particularly, um, I was covering. Uh, but perhaps even when I think about it, perhaps even before that, on the suburbans, there was a particular suburban at the time called the City Messenger, which was based in the CBD of Adelaide. It was a great little newspaper. So it was like a little, you know, little mini metro, and um, my beat at the time was the Adelaide City Council and the mayor and a few other people used to say my god Carrie you're such a terrier you know and so that sort of stuck and funny all these years later that's what I ended up you know as you know calling my um, my, my now my new venture not so new now but mm. yeah it's interesting but those that's great and more than one person called you that did it, it sort of got around 
it sort of got around exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's and revealing it, yeah i think it is isn't it thinking back and i think the qualities of a terrier you know especially when you're younger you know these days it's a little harder to maintain that momentum i say but um but you know that sort of desire to get to the story but do it in an ethical way and a, and a kind way, funnily enough, where you treat people fairly. Those sort of values, mm. I think, are important too. So you get to be known as a, you know, a good journo, not just mm. a ruthless journo. So that's, that's pretty much my little snapshot of how... That's that interesting, um, you know, that you had that. And it's not at all surprising that you have that because that is the, the marker of success. In fact, good writing is not necessarily what you need to make it as a journalist. I mean, the better you are as a journalist, the better you're writing. But we used to talk about in recruitment at the Sydney Morning Herald, we used to talk about hunger. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that's the, it's just another word for the same thing. Yeah? Absolutely. And I think, you know, Jock, uh, I've worked in academia a bit like you as well. And the one thing I used to say was you can't, it's really hard to teach that. You can teach better writing, uh, I was a terrible writer when I first started. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. I didn't even, I, I did a teaching degree. I was a primary school teacher. That was my qualification. Hmm. And I fell into the local newspaper somehow, as you did back then. I don't even know. And I was, a t I was, t I was hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. So this, the writing part of it followed. The enthusiasm, hmm. I don't know. It's something you've, you've either, you've got it. Um, and then if you've got it, it can be nurtured. So it's something hmm. that really does, I think, uh, differentiate you from, Perhaps, you know, other journos around us. It does. And enthusiasm is not quite the same thing as hunger, but they sit alongside each other and, and you can't really be hungry without enthusiasm. Correct, yes. Um, <laughs> and, and, but enthusiasm goes a long way in any job, I think, um, in terms of if you just want to get into it and, and, and bosses respond to that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, uh, again, just one of the anecdotes that used to float around. And I... You know, I look back on this and think it's interesting to think about, but someone used to say, look, you know, there are journos you hire, you get sort of two for the price of one in one person, you know, because that person turns up in the morning with some story ideas. You don't have to tell them um, what, you know, what am I going to do today, boss, but you've already got mm. some stories when you arrive at work. Those sort of things differentiate you. And at the time, I didn't even know I was doing it. I just, it just was something innate. But looking back, they're the qualities that I can see now when I'm, nurturing you know mentoring up the next generation of journos they're the sort of things i i try and encourage as much as writing ability and all those sort of things is those kind of uh, you know that as you said the hunger the enthusiasm but mm. the curiosity mm. the desire to know uh, what's really going on you know that sort of stuff i think is really important it's crucial and curiosity and the desire to know i suppose that's a bit similar thing um is that where the ideas come from I think so. Yeah, for sure. And I know with what I do here now, um, I'm not a newspaper by any stretch. So I have to sort of think outside the square all the time, you know, with a story, I'm thinking what part of that hasn't been covered yet? Or is there another way of looking at this? That's not so obvious. Um, what hasn't someone looked at in Warnable for a while? So I'll just dig or ask people, you know, just it, it's really about trying to think of different ways to come into uh, what can be a crowded field, depending on where you're working. Um, even though, mm. you know, even in my little town here, even though regional journalism is, oh boy, that's not a whole story, isn't it? Regional journalism is at a crisis point, but big trouble. Yeah, yeah. Here in Warrnambool, we still do have quite a few operators. So I don't want to just. Can you can you lay out the landscape? Maybe first of all, can you tell us where Warrnambool is and and just situate it geographically, and then tell us who your well, the media landscape who became your competition when you started. Sure. Well, I like to say that, you know, Warrnambool's very similar to New York and London. Um, <laughs> I am kidding. I'm kidding. Warrnambool is a, uh, about 35,000 people, little town. Well, actually, I shouldn't say little town, regional city uh, at the end of the Great Ocean Road in Victoria. So it's about oh, three hours from Melbourne, I guess, west of Melbourne on the coast. Um, quite a conservative area uh it's um dairy farming uh you know that kind of as i say quite conservative grassroots sort of place but with an emerging tree change sea change population as well and that's one of the things i've really noticed since coming back here you're getting a lot more of the um you know the people who are retiring back here having lived elsewhere etc so interesting sort of mix 
What we have in terms of media here is we have our daily newspaper, which is still, well, uh, six days a week newspaper, which has been going for over 140 years, I think now, and that's the Warnable Standard. Used to be owned by Fairfax and was a fantastic training ground for journos because you got to work with people who come down from the age and places like that to help teach you the tricks of the trade. Um, we have uh, the ABC has a, uh, an office here, Southwest Victorian office, and it's got a couple of journos in it. And we also have a um, commercial radio station, which has, I think, one journo, but still, you know, does the occasional um, you know, news bulletins and reports and that as well. So not bad for a town of our size, but having mm. said that, nowhere near what it was a few years ago either in terms of the staffing of those various things that I've just told you about. So, Yes, and that's repeated across the across the country in local newsrooms. Well, all newsrooms. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting that you say that that description is so similar to Bathurst, three hours west of Sydney. Mm. Um, one um, daily newspaper and one kind of um, weekly rag, basically. Um, and the daily's okay, but it's much reduced. Mm. And it's also with Australian Community Newspapers, or right. media, media, Australian Community Media, ACM. We interviewed Gail Tomlinson yesterday. Oh, um, right. Uh, she's head of audience. And um, it's maybe around 38,000 Bathurst with a oh. regional, another 5,000 from the region. So just under 40,000 and just over 40,000 with the region. Right. Um, and um, it's quite conservative. Five of the councillors mm. uh, out of nine are climate change denialists. Um, wow. <laughs> wow. And that, that may or may not be reflected Boy. in the population. I must find out. Um, yeah, that's that's my yeah. look radical. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we can we can redefine conservative for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we don't have a terrier, so we, mentioning that, why don't I share my screen? And then um, we're talking the dash terrier dot com dot au, and here it is on the screen. Can you see it there? I can. Um, for the purposes of. Uh, those of you, everyone at home, <laughs> here it is. Um, so it has a home page. Um, it, does. it looks quite good, doesn't it? <laughs> it does look nice today. Um, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, as we, we look through the menu here, we have tip jar. My guess is that's to help um, for, so that people, uh, that's a very funny gif, um, people can help to support your work. Yeah. So that that's donations goes Correct. through to Patreon or something, or uh, yeah, donor box or something like mm -hmm. that. One of those platforms. Yep. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, about and um, oh, that's, being in my, that's in my Adelaide days. That's a very old photograph. No, <laughs> I'm just looking at that. I have to update. You don't eat soup anymore. I don't eat. No. No. <laughs> um, the so obviously being um, a one person show. Is that right? Yes. It's just you doing all basic, basically all of the journalism. Yeah. Um, so you, your story you're about is is about you and and you know how you came to do this, and we'll we'll ask you about that next. So yeah. obviously we um, the other things are obvious contact and so on. Yeah. So then we have a homepage with stories which are local stories. Um, mm -hmm. I like this one, Barry the bullshite detector on why the CEO had to go. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell I, you about Barry. It's very important. Yes. Okay. Let's let's get to Barry in a sec. But this is an interesting um, local story because um, you know it's a council story. It's about mm -hmm. how the council is run. It's about how the councillors councillors interact with the uh, established sort of bureaucracy of the council and the mm -hmm. CEOs at the top of that. And it's an issue in every local area. Um, and I just happen to know that in the last couple of months um, of, of two New South Wales councils that have had um, CEOs deposed by councillors. So oh, okay. that's, that that's to me says, oh, there's something going on there and in the bigger picture, you know, bringing together 
you know, council, what's going on in councils, I'm thinking, oh, okay, so there's three case studies and there must be more. But that's another story, you know, how mm. a local story maybe could be national or, Absolutely. or wider. But this is a local story, as, as a lot of yours are. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got this up on, on the screen. Do you want to tell us more about what you do? Sure. Well, I think the key, like you've just said there a couple of times, you know, local is, is super, super local. Like I don't do anything literally outside of the Warrnambool boundaries. And I also, um, so geographically it's local, but also I realised early on that I was going to set myself up to be the uh, fixer of every problem in Warrnambool, which would be impossible and would exhaust me within five minutes. So what I have done pretty much is pick I think about five key issues that I follow closely and they roll in and out. And then around that, there's the odd thing that comes up, which I think, oh, that's, you know, I'll jump into that because it's an interesting one or I can, you know, sort of grab and go on that one. I don't have to stick with it like I do with these other five issues that roll around. Mm -hmm. and, and the five issues that roll around, one of those is a very broad one, the council. So mm. the council is one. And I don't follow every single thing the council does, but something like you've just explained, we've had just last week, just completely, just a rocket through the council where we lost our CEO overnight mm. uh, without any real warning. And mm. it was done with a minority, sorry, a majority vote, but a, you know, a four, three. So it was, wasn't exactly, you know, a, a, a unanimous mm. decision. So this all was worthy of investigation to me. So that's a classic example of a local, you know, very local, but as you say, potentially has links elsewhere, which I don't, I haven't gone into those links elsewhere, as you mentioned, but possibly could, mm -hmm. you know, because funnily enough, just as you're saying that, um, just as an aside, one of the people who was uh, on the review committee of our CEO is a, a sort of a, a statewide figure for council operations and she's written a paper about this very thing about ceos getting sacked all over the place so what's going mm. on so mm. that, that is an interesting mm. you could pull that up um, but yeah in terms of local the key to me is to keep it super super local um, you know the hyper local word and to be very sort of restrained in what i cover because i literally the, the more successful i get in the sense that the more people know about me the more requests i get to look into various issues and it, and it becomes overwhelming and I have to say to the you know, people, look, at the moment I've got my issues, but if there's something else that's really coming along that I can look at, I will, um, particularly if one of those issues drops away, which some of them do because they're resolved. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real discipline around what it is you decide to cover. Mm. And, and for me, the council is probably the most important thing because uh, I, when I returned to Warrnambool, um, which is now seven years ago, I realised that, as we talked about before, newsrooms, there was just wasn't the resources being put into that sort of coverage that I used to see, uh, that sort of really mm. intense coverage of what's really going on. So mm. that became a, a field for me to, to delve into. And as soon as I started to do that, the response was amazing. People would just keep going, keep going, keep going. And uh, that's been the real, one of the real strengths, I think, of the Terrier. Um, living up to my name, I suppose, you know what I mean? Like really digging yeah, what's yeah. going on. Exactly how long is it that you've been going now? Well, I had a, there was a, a precursor to the Terrier um, mm. called Bluestone Magazine, which was more of what it sounded like, a, a magazine-y mm. style. Mm. Uh, I first came back to Warrnambool and that was much more of a soft, you know, sort of softer stories, um, but some opinion as well. And what I noticed was the opinion stories were the ones everyone read. The softer stories, people like, you know, we, we see that already in our local paper, and, you know. We mm. read, the minute I wrote anything opinionated, and that the word opinion is an interesting one, as we know, because in journalism, we're not supposed to have an opinion. <laughs> but, but I certainly have an opinion now. It's funny. I've had to unlearn a lot of my, you know, balanced, you know, stuff, which I'll get onto in a minute. But um, yeah. how that works, because it's not, yeah. Anyway, so, so the opinion was what really um, got into people's heads. They wanted to, they, they loved the fact that I, I sort of spoke spoke about stuff that people were talking about down the street, but no one was game to print, you know, that sort of thing. And you talked about it in a way that people down the street talk about it, yeah? So exactly. someone down the street, literally outside the news agent, say, as opposed yep. to inside it in the newspaper, doesn't yes. say, you know, have some formal voice or some objective voice. Yes, exactly. Very, very conversational style. I spoke of us and we and our, you know, words like that, um, our council and we have mm. a right and 
that was something I learned from the ABC years ago. They often use that, you know, in, uh, not necessarily reporters, but in their commentators and things. It's our, our ABC, your ABC, that sort of ownership. Mm. Uh, we're part of this together. So I, I make it personal, conversational, opinionated. Uh, I give a view and you can either agree or disagree with it. And um, but that view critically is based on facts. Like I don't just say this is what I think's happening or it's stuff that I've dug out and I can say, look at this. What mm -hmm. do you think of this? You know, how do you, and that's a classic example of what happened with the, um, with the CEO being sacked was, mm. hang on a minute, this is what actually happened. Was this, are we okay with this? And mm. that's the style that people really love. It's sort of that chatty and uh, uh, some humor, which mm -hmm. again, humor is a great, tool as the chaser has proven mm -hmm. <laughs> and it. as as vloggers um as vloggers also you know all kinds of other non-journalistic um entrants into the media space uh, yeah. especially since social media have established that not hi k that not everything um is about all of that straight stuff of the past and yes. they're influencing how that we do it well let's then have a look at both the humor and an example of that you're talking about i'll go back to mm -hmm. the screen share mm -hmm. and um where were we oh we've got on full screen oh, oh no. hang on oh we're looking at all uh we have here? to go to this one. Oh, it's a problem with um it's a problem with full screen on um on chrome that's all um so i'm just getting my technical ducks in a row. Uh, oh, it's still gone. Okay. Oh. I'm just going to recording on sharing screen mm. and that's got it. Barry. So we have um, both the sort of um, the research and the facts, and we also have the humor. So Correct. tell us about Barry and his. Well, Barry was introduced detector. last year. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Barry was introduced last year. I realised the room for humour came through the terrier theme where I could bring different terriers in as, as characters to help sort of, uh, I guess, liven up things a little bit, but also, as I say, bring in that humour. So Barry is, as you can see there with my very, you can tell my graphic design work is a little, um, needs a little work, but you can see Barry is a little bull terrier, the little white fella down the side there. Mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've managed to somehow rather very badly cut and paste him onto a detector, which you'll see I've changed into B00 for born and bull. Mm -hmm. bull. Mm -hmm. You see all the humour here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do, does the audience get it? They do. They do. The yeah, locals do. Yeah, the locals yeah, do. And they yeah. love Barry because he came in last year. As, uh, I said, look, this is something about something was so utterly ridiculous. I said, oh, I think we need the, the bullshite detector on this one. And then suddenly I thought, I don't, I'm going to call him Barry the bullshite detector and create this little character. So whenever he turns up, people know that I'm going to do like a, a blow by blow description of why this is bullshite. And what I did with that particular piece was just go through uh, the councillors had put out a statement on why, yes, you can see it here, why they, why they had sacked our CEO. So I just went through each line and as Barry with the red type there, that was Barry responding to each line. Oh, okay. So the first one um, is a quote that says, some will wonder why we are seeking to make a key personnel change. So that's a sort of um, press release language from, uh, the, from the yep. councillors. And Barry says, you must be wondering why we decided to throw the CEO out, CEO out now, so close to an election when you could throw us out. Correct. So he's actually filtered what they're saying through his language. And I went through that line by line by line. And by the end And that's of it, not traditional journalism, obviously. So this is the freedom that you... No, <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> it is the freedom and it's why I enjoy it so much because, and I think it's why, I think it's why people enjoy it so much here too, because it's something so different. And yet you can come away thinking, actually, why is that? Why has this happened? And Barry's got, you know, he's on something there. So even though I'm being a bit cheeky, this is a really class. This is, you know, I don't do this often, by the way. This is probably once every five months Barry comes out because, you know, you can overdo it and then you sort of lose it. It becomes a bit, so it's a rare thing. But when he comes out, it's like, okay, there's no other way I can possibly explain this that's going to be interesting and exciting to you than to try and do it like this. Because to try and break down that press release line by line, you know, 
that's mm. not going to work. So to have Barry do it, and everyone came away thinking, yep, it's patronising, uh, the timing's very strange, we've got more questions than what we started with, we need to dig further. So that was really the message I wanted to get across, and uh, mm. yeah, I think it works. I think it works. So, so in have... deconstructing what you're doing then, um, mm. it is news, and it is drawing on facts, it's drawing on research, so that's all standard journalism stuff yep. what's and even analysis is not that different but it's the way you do the analysis because yes. it's i wouldn't call it opinion either i mean I, i'd call it maybe analysis with an opinionated sort of slant to it yeah i think that's right i think that's probably a much better description i've always sort of toggled between the two is it analysis opinion appeal analysis i think you're mm. right it's, it's it's both and and as I say, the key to it, though, is a hell of a lot of work goes into reading. You know, there's so much reading into all these pieces. I just go through all the documents, all the, you know, agendas. It makes sure you got everything right because if you don't, you know, well, of course, one, you lose credibility and that's the greatest value you have, um, mm. of course. But also, I don't want to have anyone coming back to me saying I need to make an uh, issue an apology or something awful like that because that, again, you know, undermines your credibility. I haven't had to do that mm. yet. I don't know how I got away with it to be honest well that's your <laughs> that's your years of experience uh from when you yeah. used to be a soup eater um yes. you know, <laughs> when i could afford to eat off. those sort of things <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> now it's no, the restaurants. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't tell anyone yeah no that, that's very true and look, that that's where i'm again it's it's hard it's hard for me to say you know to younger people just coming out of journalism hey give this a shot because you do have to have a sense of you know what you what is you know what's possible what's legal what's you know um, but also mm. just the confidence the, the confidence in your voice which i think as older people we get you just get you know yeah you do and you get that confidence from knowing that your analysis is based on 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 your accumulation of of knowledge and insights and understanding yep. um, absolutely Jock. Absolutely. and that's not that younger people can't have that some could but it just gets easier correct absolutely you you feel like you have you know, you've got enough experience behind you to have a valid opinion and analysis, if you know what I mean. You can, you can put it out there and people listen. And I think for me, one of the things I've said many times um, is that coming back here, I had to regain or re-establish my credibility. It didn't, it didn't matter who I'd worked for. That didn't matter to people. That, it's funny because I think bylines and things are stuff that, you know, journos notice. But most readers, I find, are... Uh, are more interested in the what you're actually producing is it um is it what you're producing now so with, with the fact that i worked for the australian or you know it really didn't mean much to people they just wanted to make sure what i was writing now mm. was credible and it would stack up and you could pull it apart and you know it was correct what i was writing was correct you know so or factually what's the word sustainable <laughs> you know you could mm. go back and check those facts mm. and that's mm. really mm. critical to what i do because otherwise you know I've always struggled with the word blogger because sometimes that's used in a derogatory phrase. Like you're just a blogger, you know, you just, mm. and, and there's, you know, there's no sort of differentiation of bloggers. There's bloggers who will sit at home and just type whatever they want. And then there's bloggers mm. like Catherine Murphy at the Guardian, who's mm. brilliant, you know, so I would like to think I'm a blogger, but a blogger journalist, you know, towards this end of the spectrum, does, you, know, do, you do the hard work. There's certainly not just a matter of sitting up and you know, typing whatever I want. Yeah, yeah, there is a difference. And, and, and um, a couple more questions briefly, like obviously, or maybe this is just a statement, but all of this voice thing that we've just been talking about, that's coming out of audience. You said that, you said that people responded to it. So it's about identifying, finding a local audience and then speaking or producing content or what have you, journalism, that they respond to as opposed to any kind of sense of what had been done in the past so yeah. yeah absolutely and again that's been a big big change for me i think coming from uh the traditional journalism background where you're very much you know you're behind you, you, your personality is not part of that or mm. you're not speaking directly to them what i'm finding here is that by speaking directly to the people in a way and also you know using common language like you said like people in the street might discuss something um there's a feeling of ownership, I suppose. People feel like they're part of it. And it's not just me talking down to them from my lofty towers of wherever I might be, where you've got to get a swipe card to come in and out and all that sort of thing. We're so removed mm. in a lot of ways from the audience. 
Mm. Here, um, people feel very much a part of the terrier. And I actually refer to them as terriers. I say, all the terriers out there are telling me what's going on. And I was going to do just something funny because you've, mm. I'll quickly bring this in, but I've just started, I've got an exclusive range of T-shirts, which we're, um, <laughs> which we're just starting off. Now, this is, this is actually in response to a, um, a troll said this about me. Can you believe it? Shitty left-wing media page. Some troll said yep. that on yep. Facebook or something. Correct. So we decided yeah. we'd poke some T-shirts out of it. And, yeah, that's great. And now everyone wants one. So it's about yeah. turning stuff around and making it um, part of a, you know, a fun, uh, I don't know, fun but fun but engaging but important but active. You know, it's all those sort of things that come into it and it's evolving as we speak. So I still don't quite know what, where it's going or how it's going to all end up. Mm. But at the moment, we're having a lot of fun doing it, that's for sure. That's great. Um, I'll come back to whether you're making any money later, but I want to leave some space for, for Brooke and Kay, if you want to, um, to ask some questions or make some comments. Brooke, did you have any thoughts? Or I mean, Brooke is from Warrnambool. Yes. Um, so oh. there's, there's number one connection. That's why she's in a caravan. <laughs> it's too cold. <laughs> um. I um I had I wrote questions as I was going and you kind of answered them as you were going as well. Ah. Um, but there's um there's just one that I wanted to to touch on and it's not directly related to what we've been talking about um but I've always wondered it. Um when when you broke the credit card wrought scandal in mm. um in the council I remember reading along and um at points you were, you were posting screenshots of emails that you'd received pretty much saying like, we're not telling you anything. Mm. Um, yes, that's right. Stop, just stop. And yeah, um, right. at that point when the council just shut down and you couldn't get more information, mm. how did you go about finding and actually, I, I guess, fixing the issue in the end? It, Cause mm. it was your voice that really pushed for it. Yeah, that's an interesting story, that one, because that really was, to me, the turning point for the Terrier's credibility, I think, because that story um, was such, a, as you said, it involved such a lot of hard work um, with FOIs and blockages and not getting anywhere and pushing through all that um, and having a result at the end where, just to colour in for the people that are listening here, it's ended up in an ombudsman's inquiry, which we're just waiting on now to hear what the results of that are. But um, to be honest with you, Brooke, what really was the key was I had a couple of insiders to help me who knew what I was looking for, knew I wasn't getting it, and fortunately were able to see the, the, the importance that that information come out. So your classic leak, you know, really. Um, and I suppose because I'd already put in some hard yards prior to that story coming out and building up that credibility I talked about before, they felt they could trust me with that information. So again, classic journalism, building contacts, building relationships, um, uh, being you know, sensitive to that and nurturing of those relationships. And that, that whole story took probably 12 months, I think, to before it all broke. Um, so it's that slow, 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 so I'll start again, slow, long, deep dive stuff that um, the terrier can do too. But, you don't have, you know, I don't, I say, I sort of talk about it in the third person a bit because it does involve a lot of other people behind the scenes, you know, in terms of material coming to me. And sometimes they take uh, months and months. And that was one, that was a classic example. The, the council did everything they could to throw the, the bus in the way of that story coming out. And it probably would not have come out to the full extent that it did without the help of those insiders. So praise be to them is what I often say. Um, so we, you know, as I said, we're just waiting to see what the outcome of all that is now. But that was definitely one of the defining moments for the terrier, I suppose. That um, that particular piece. So thank you for bringing it up. No, I was I was really impressed with it. That that's almost what made me. Um, I knew I I wanted to be a journalist, but that's what made me really passionate about it. Was seeing how much difference that particular oh. story made. Well, so, that's great to hear, isn't it? Yeah. I, I'll have to get that clip, Jock. Could you just clip that out for me? That bit and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can put it on as a I'll gift. A, exactly. <laughs> we'll have to think of a terrier, a terrier analogy there as well. But, but that's really fantastic to hear in all seriousness because that's what I'm hoping this whole exercise and why I wanted to talk to you today is, you know, you can do it. You know, you can do it. Um, 
and there, you know, one person can do it. I mean, even as I talk about having, yes, I've got experience, I know what to do, I know where to go, but I'm hoping in the future that people like me and Jock can do master classes on how you do FOIs, uh, how to, how to, you know, to, to give you the tools to do this sort of stuff because. It's really about knowing where to look. And I think that's what the council here didn't like the fact that I knew where to look because a lot of people hadn't looked there. You know, in fact, no one had looked there. Um, one of the things I'd like to mention is that when I first went down to the council here um, to put in a freedom information application, the, the woman behind the desk did not know what I was talking about and asked her staff and said, no, I didn't know what I was talking about. It turns out no one had actually lodged an application for something like eight, nine years. And certainly it wasn't from a newspaper. So that showed me that people hadn't been using the tools that were there. And that's just, you know, that's just about teaching people where to look. And what I'm trying to do now is to encourage the community to do that. Like, you don't have to rely just on me to do it. You can do it too. So how do you do an FOI? You know, how do you lodge it? What do you say? How much it costs, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how we can empower people to become terriers, as I like to say. We don't, uh, we don't have to just have it all ourselves. We can... We can spread the spread the skill base. So yeah, that was a that whole credit card thing really was an interesting one because people could see how it could be done and what they could find out as a result. And lo and behold, there was a lot to find out. I, I can't wait to see what the ombudsman comes up with. Actually, what can you say that um, you know safely that's uh, that 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 established that there was a credit card abuse um, get systemically or within a small just a small little cohort of. That, I guess that, Jock, is what we're waiting to hear from the Ombudsman. I've got my own theories on it. Um, okay. uh, my theory is it certainly was beyond one person, but at the moment, the, the, you know, the, I guess the jury's out. Um, but I've certainly seen evidence that I haven't printed, but mm. of it going further. So, yes, there was a, there, the system had broken down and there was, um, there was expenditure going on that was just, you know, unjustifiable and then to you know as a reward we got our rates uh, put up so <laughs> and so you've got more stories happy. to come on this. oh yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah. yes yeah waiting waiting patiently to see what the ombudsman comes up with first though what were your other five areas you mentioned that there were five so you had council as one and you had five areas of focus yeah well really quickly the other ones were and i hope you can remember them now but, but the, one of them comes under the sort of the council is we've got we had a, a massive argument here about racehorse training on our local beaches uh, where professional racehorses, you know, would be trained on a wild beach, what's relatively a wild beach out um, West Warrnambool here. So there was a big campaign about that to try and stop that from happening. So that was one of the ones that I was really heavily involved with. Uh, another one is I've been involved with our local water treatment plants about to be upgraded and it still pours um, treated sewerage into the ocean. So that's a big environmental issue locally that I've been following. Um, the fourth one is our biggest aged care home here. Um, had some uh, serious allegations around bullying, a lot of staff were leaving, staff morale issues. Been looking into that one and got myself my first uh, legal suit out of that, <laughs> which uh, interesting of that one. Um, and the fifth one, which is a completely escaping me right now off the top of my head, which makes me think that I'll have to come back to you on that because I just can't remember off the top of my head which one that is. I obviously haven't touched on it for a while. Maybe it was the council. Did I cover that? Anyway. Yeah, I think that was the first one. Uh, it'll it'll come. It'll come. So you mentioned the legal case. So you, it's obviously public interest journalism. A lot, you know, that kind of those things you mentioned um, is not the lighter end of journalism. Mm. To what extent do you feel that you're part of a new wave? How how many um, comrades do you have around? the country in other local areas doing local journalism mm. that is, you know, of some substance. Um, yeah. And I suppose we're talking anything in a sense that steps outside of established media, it's probably going to be online. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily, think, but probably. Yes. Well, I think, um, oh, actually, look, it's just kind of me. The fifth one, of course, was the credit cards. That's why I, sorry, put that to one side. So, yeah. I'm glad I could remember that. Um, just to answer what you're saying, though, that's a really interesting question because I think this is what's starting to emerge now. You know, these little, little hyper-local startups like me, or I like to call us upstarts, um, who are agitating and irritating and um, just doing it in a, you know, a small, low-cost way. Um, funnily enough, the more I do like sort of interviews and things with the ABC, for example, the more I hear from other people elsewhere doing similar things, be it little newspapers or 
little online ventures to the point where there's a few of us now trying to organize some like little hyper local association, you know, a little group of us to try and get together and, and let, you know, let the government know in particular that we're out here because often with funding opportunities, they forget us and say, you know, if you've got a $30 million turnover, let us know and we'll help you sustain your operations. And we're like, $30 million, hmm, let me think about that. So there's a, there's a layer of us out there who are, who are much below that, uh, but are starting to fill in the gaps that have been left uh, by the bigger operators moving out or have never had uh, something like this in the first place. So, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I know, I've noticed too, there's little things like someone called The Beagle, which is a great, so we've obviously got a lot in common. And they're over, I think, <laughs> some, I hope I said this right, I think they're over in Bega somewhere and we connect on Facebook. And so there's a few of us coming around now and, and uh, supporting each other as best we can to, mm. just, hang, just to hang in there, I think is the main thing at the moment until the funding model's worked out, which is $64,000 question. Yeah, so obviously donations can work because it's public interest and because you're not, uh, commercially driven and you're not making a big profit so you know your yeah. local daily can't do that Absolutely. and that's the reason that the guardian can mm -hmm. to some extent um well to a great extent they they are successful in that in australia but um the ones i've noticed are the Naracourt news just because yes. of listening to things you know so they have three journals mm -hmm. and one salesperson and they had a paper close mm -hmm. they've got a paper um, so they were just, you know, interviewed as an example of something like you and, uh, you know, and you've been interviewed too. And then the Manning Valley something news That's uh, right. by a, a well-known writer. Um, but there's bound to be dozens more. Um, yes. But, you know, oh, there's, yeah. because there's 500 and something uh, councils, I think, in Australia. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you think of local as a, roughly speaking a council area, which it isn't in Sydney anymore, um, yeah. Some of the councils are so big, but it, roughly speaking, um, and a lot of those, even before this year's chaos, so say so mid last year, quite a few of those uh, weren't um, having coverage from local papers. So we're talking right. a few dozen mm -hmm. um, of those, but that must be now much greater because of those um, ones that were receiving coverage, even, even um, you know, a sizable chunk of those had one reporter covering a whole patch doing everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. And that's exhausting, isn't it? I mean, mm. I don't but know. They can't cover council properly. When no, you, you just can't. And that's where hopefully, you know, something like what I'm trying to do here, even if you just had one of me, you know, like this sort of model, mm. one or two people in a mm. really low cost environment, um, you know, you'd hope that's the future because I, I honestly can't see what the other options are. We can't go back to, you know, advertising and classifieds and all those lovely, remember that phrase, rivers of gold? Gosh, it's almost becoming something out of another era, rivers of gold that used to uh, sustain us all. You know, that's just all, that, I can't see that ever coming back. So I, I'm just trying to, I still don't know how we are going to fund newspaper journalism. I don't, I don't know. No, it's a good question. Um, I'll, I, I hear some other voices. I, I was just going to ask, and you may, and I'm sorry I've come late to this meeting. I was at a, yes. uh, attending another Hello. club. Hello. And um, how exciting um, the work that you're doing and being able to focus on specific stories and doing them mm. properly and well. And as you said, in local newspapers, the person power is so low. Yes. So much yes. has to be covered in breadth that there's, it's difficult to have depth. But I don't know if you've already covered this, but we talk about the funding model collapsing. Mm -hmm. um, and in local media, local newspapers, there's always been such a strong relationship between the support of the newspaper and the people yeah. that they get advertising revenue are the people yes. they need to investigate. And that's always been a lot. Oh, absolutely. So I suppose you're released from that. Do you have anything to say about... Um, about, alter about the ex existing traditional small newspaper and their relationship to council advertising, oh. to advertising with developers and real estate agents yes. and all the people you'd want to investigate. No, I think you must have been. Have you been down in Warrnambool lately? Because you've just nailed it there. You've nailed it, absolutely. Because that relationship, particularly with um, real estate, you know, developers, um, I don't think it's any secret that ACM, for example, um, have a strong relationship with real estate as, as the backbone to their uh, advertising model. Um, our local paper is an example of that. Um, I'm not sure what that means then if you've got 
issues which I'm pretty sure are happening right here as we speak around developers and things that are going on. You know, it's always the classic rural council, council story, isn't it? The blocks of land that suddenly get rezoned and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But you're absolutely right. You know, those sort of connections now are even uh, more troublesome because the reliance on those advertisers is so much greater because they are the backbone, it seems to me, of the survival of, uh, of our local papers with an S, I'll say quickly. But also other things too, like one of the stories I just touched on before is one of my five, without going too deep into it, um, is the aged care home here. Again, massive advertiser locally and litigious. So that combination is, um, you know, to use that phrase, has a chilling effect on journalists like myself wanting to go in and go in hard and go in deep. So I, you know, I see the local paper not covering that, uh, even though they know the stuff that I know. So it's, it's tricky. And I, I think it really does come back to what are we going to do as far as funding models go, because local advertising is not going to work. And that's where I think readership uh, contributions, I use that word as opposed to subscriptions, I suppose, um, can, uh, are paired with some sort of philanthropic support and, dare I say, government support is probably the only way through. I, I, I can't see how otherwise how we can remain independent and hope to report on, you know, without fear or favour. Now, didn't hmm. Fletcher a few months ago, I think Jock and I even wrote some articles about it, but I focused on something else, unveil a package of funding to support regional newspapers and mm. um, because of the, the COVID collapse in advertising revenues and so forth. And I think I might have missed the discussion. Did, are you in any position to access that funding or do you not meet the criteria? Well, funny, I, just quickly on that, I've had a couple of, there's been a couple of funds that have come and gone um, in the past. They've had various names and I can never remember which ones are what, but there was a regional package. I think it came out about 12 months ago, the first one. And mm. that was the one which, you know, you had to have, I think you had to have something like a million dollar turnover or something to apply, which was just straight away ridiculous. And I remember writing them quite harshly. I didn't hear back, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I did write to them and say, you know, how could you possibly be targeting a regional media when that's your, that's your, um, you know, your cutoff point. Fortunately, since then, we've had as a result of, I think it's pretty much a result of COVID-19, the, the ping, what's called the ping packages, which is the public interest news gathering that's the what I was thinking of. And do that's you the most recent. One. Believe it or not, I did, and I got some funding. So that was a big. Ah, oh, because I thought that was a bit of a furphy. I thought that it would well, really be encouraging left wing media. Or well, <laughs> I don't think question. maybe they didn't. They might not have read my application too closely because I, <laughs> I think I managed to slip through. Now that whole ping project, though, is going to be explored in ways I hope soon because it seems to me it's, it was a very strange model how they've worked out who they're going to fund and who they're not a lot of people missed out um without wanting to you know i hope i've got this right but i know there's a little local paper over yonder that you may have mentioned before jock which applied uh was bought i think you know local fellows bought it to try and restart the paper didn't get any money whatsoever and yet acm which closed papers is getting money to reopen Sorry. those papers so That's this sort of thing's odd, isn't it? You know, it makes people feel a little bit bitter when, mm. you've, hang, when you've hung in there. Um, but look, I, having said that, I'm extremely grateful for the money that I got. I, I was thrilled, but I'm just a little bit disappointed to hear that it wasn't a wider, you know, perhaps a, a wider... I mean, having said that, look, I haven't seen the whole list of people yet, but I'm already hearing a little bit of stuff coming down the chain that um, smaller operators may not have, may not have been... Uh, it's included, you know, the numbers of may not have, may, may not have been high. I, I don't know. But as I say, I'm grateful for the bit that I got and it'll keep me going for a little bit longer, at least another six months or so, I hope, to, to really try and um, establish what I'm going to do longer term to, to sustain myself. That's the main thing at the moment, as I said, just hanging in there and uh, seeing what happens with these funding packages, et cetera, that are coming through. I'm hating to go back into history, but I'm interested to know how you enjoy working at The Australian given um, <laughs> how was that? <laughs> and um, how was that? Was that? What period was that? Well, it was, uh, I was there under Chris Mitchell and David, oh, yes. Arm David Armstrong before that. Um, 
Look, I, I found that an amazing experience because the opportunities were incredible. You know, the, the, um, the budgets were incredible. You could, it was just before everything collapse. started to collapse. Yeah. You know, the good old days we like to talk about. Uh, it was tough though. I mean, hard, you know, there's um, not, not a place for people who might be, uh, what, would, what would be the word, wilting flowers. <laughs> you sort of had to have a strong spine. But it gave me, look, it gave me the strong spine, which is why now it's sort of interesting because whatever I confront now, even though it's hard at the time, you know, you get that pushback, um, it's nothing to what I used to have to endure sometimes, you know, with, um, with the Australian. And what I mean by that is um, the pressure to, to, to perform under pressure, uh, to get things done, to have... Um, you know, to have people telling me I'd done the wrong thing, you know, because of, and I mean, I'm saying readers at this point, like getting blowback from the council, for example, I'd say, well, that's okay. I don't, I can wear that because I've had experience with that. On people a, don't like you right the truth. I mean, no so one what, is ever happy with, no one is ever happy with a story that's written about them by a journalist. Yeah, exactly. Not the, exactly. Not the way they see it ever exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No one's yep. ever completely happy with you. That's true. And I think, you know, I think there was, there's an old saying someone said once, I can't remember who it was, but I think it was days when Simon Crean was around. I think someone said, as long as Simon Crean was calling them and whoever the, you know, whoever his, it might have, I can't remember who it was now, whoever his opponent was, so to speak, on the Liberal side, as long as they were both complaining, then they knew they were doing their job well. And I thought that's sort of where I sit too. I think as long as everyone's feeling like they're equally as upset with me and equally as happy with me, that's a very strange thing that's just happened behind you there, Joe. It's like a pink coat with nobody in it. <laughs> Did you see that or is it just me? Yeah, it must be something to do with the green screen. <laughs> it was surreal. I'm married to anyway. a pink coat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the pink co oh, I see. Oh, and what, it's the green screen. <laughs> well, now the pink coat has a face, thankfully. Oh, sorry. It just was the strangest thing. Just it is, isn't it? Coat. It's a real Zoom thing. Yeah, but so sorry, Kay. Just to answer your question, I would say it was it was tough and but but incredible place to to work and to learn. That's for sure. It's it's changed a lot since then. I'd be interested to explore that a little, just on, from the News Corp point of view, because you were so long with them, at least twenty four years. You were saying, mm -hmm. um, um, and, and and it's obviously different at locals. But when you get to that Australian level, we've had Robert Mann and all kinds of other people from. Um, the centre and the left and David McKnight and many, many, many people have an analysis either deeply informed or otherwise of News Corp. You were kind of hinting at the kind of just the work pressure there. Um, mm. that's, that's not necessarily to do with ideology, is it? Although it could be a cultural thing. Um, I mean, ultimately, ultimately, specifically in those, in those bigger newsrooms and metros and the Oz, you know, were, were they were they doing good work for the right reasons? Um, what did you think of that enterprise? I'm pausing because it, I think it changed in the time that I was there. And to be really honest with you, I probably saw the writing on the wall. Um, I could see where the Australian was going ideologically. And uh, when I left, I sort of, came to the conclusion that, well, one, the types of the, the, the way it was leaning, it was sort of the, the Keith Windshuttle years, you might remember, um, about the, they were really sort of looking back at the uh, Aboriginal history of Tasmania, et cetera, and sort of dissecting whether or not it was really, what really had happened had happened. And that's mm. all fine, but- I The history thinking, wars. The history wars, exactly. And- that sort of stuff started to come in and I, I could just feel myself thinking, I don't know if I want to be part of where this is going. And there were lots of other things going on as well. I was probably ready for a change, you know, but it's hard because I don't want to say, I, you know, I, I, I have an amazing amount of respect for all the people who've worked there and still do mm -hmm. work there. But I think there is a, you know, you do feel there was a change of an ideological change that happened for sure. And I, Mm, I, while I really valued my time there and I learned so much and had some great mentors, fantastic mentors, I felt the time was right for me to go because I just didn't feel I could write from the heart, you know, anymore. It sounds a little bit soppy and silly, but, um, no. I don't know, I think you have to stick to your values and don't you and your ethics and your, not so much ethics, but it's, it's, it's values. I think it's where you sit and feel comfortable and 
it no longer start, it started to feel increasingly uncomfortable for me. So mm. that's just me personally. And um, mm. it's probably also why I enjoy what I do now because I, I'm quite overt about my, my political take on things. In fact, I say it on the front of the website, you know, this is who I am. I, again, I read a lot about that before I started the Terrier was be upfront, you know, don't tell people where you're coming from. And then they can say, okay, well, there's no, we're not being duped here. You know, we haven't been, haven't been sucked in. You know, we're reading you knowing that you've got a left leaning. Um, make of it what you will. So, yes. It's and that's a bit, a bit part of like having a conversation. You're like, you know, if you're, if you're at a party, you don't pretend that you're neutral or pretend that you're exactly. not who you exactly. are. Yep. Um, yes, hmm. that's right. And I think that's the thing, you know, I think it's sort of like a bit of a game, isn't it? That the, the hmm. newspapers pretend to be neutral, but in fact... Hmm. They're not. not. They're not. Mm. They're so not. perfect objectivity. There just isn't. You can aim for Absolutely. it. You you can can aim for it. Yep. And but you can't. You, exactly. Yeah, it's they, one of the, yeah. Sorry, Claire. about who you are and your position or your lens is probably mm. the mm. solution, really. Yep. Mm. And I think yeah, readers respect. more fun that you can actually, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to answer to an editor. You, you are the editor and... Um, and you don't have to answer to a possible ideological slant. You don't self-centre. Mm -hmm. um, and also the work you do probably has changed the way the council operates in that it has to be know that you are there. And it, uh, absolutely. It may not happen just because they know you're there and they are going to have to improve or lift their game, which I call a sociological role of journalism in that it's not just the stories journalists publish, but how everything operates differently, knowing that there's that accountability there. So I don't know if Absolutely. you feel that you have a shift in the way local organisations operate where you, you are working now. Totally, totally. That is a really good point because it's, it's not so much even like you say what I write, it's just they know I might write it and I might know about it. And in fact, anecdotally, I hear that a lot. People say to me that meetings are now held where... <laughs> That's funny, where they talk behind the scenes about what if the terrier finds out about this. <laughs> so I love that. <laughs> and I love the fact it's the terrier, that this name, the terrier, because that's to me what it's all about. It's, the, it's not just me. It's this group. You know, it's this movement. It's this little thing that's growing in Warrnambool. And, you know, for a town this size, I think it's got about five, nearly close to 5,000 followers now on Facebook. And it's, you know... I can't believe it. I was thrilled we got a hundred. I got a hundred likes when I started, and I was like, "Yeah, hundred likes!" You know, so it's 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 taking off, and it's um it's just what you said, Kate. It's about them knowing that we're here, and this is what journalism's about. As you say, this is the bridge, isn't it? The peak between the people and our authorities is, you know, we're here. We're watching. We're watching. We're and watching. you're digging. And you're establishing some values because they don't know it, but they are shifting their values to align. They may do it reluctantly. But they're starting to be taught what is the pro and to think about what's the right way to operate. You're actually shifting the values that people are operating with and informing people about a set of values, not just about things they need to know about, but just ways things can be and should be. And yeah. You're changing That's everyone's mindset, not just organisations by the sounds, but everyone who reads you, they're suddenly thinking, oh, God, I shouldn't accept this, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Mm -hmm. I think that's... Look, I tell you, you've nailed it. And I think that's why I do what I do because I don't need to do it because I want to, um, you know, hone my writing skills. I don't want to sound, you know, silly about that. But you know what I mean? It's like I don't need to do that stuff again. But what I really want to do and really makes me feel good is to give my hometown that little bit of chutzpah back again. You know, get that, get that, you know, don't just, don't just take this. This is, not, this is not how it has to be. And I'm noticing as we're leading up to the elections uh, here, the council elections, that we've got this enormous discussion and debate going on and people are all wondering who's going to stand and, oh, are you going to stand? And, what are, and we've got to storm the barricades. You know, it's, it's great. It's fabulous. I mean, from where, when I came back seven years ago and everyone was just in this funk of like, well, this is how, the classic quote, this is just how it is in Warrnambool, you know, I thought, no, it's not. And, and um, it's been great to be able to stir, you know, stir that... Uh, you know, that civic activity again, you know, getting people back into the chambers to listen to the meetings, the Zoom meeting, the Zoom council meetings are now compulsory viewing. Can you believe it? Wow, it's yeah, it's because... happening here in Bathurst too, the Zoom meetings. Isn't it so great? Everyone, it's, that, it's great. Just, just, just leave just, your lounge room now. 
to get exactly. in Exactly. And just that, you know, our council was so reluctant to have live streaming. It was, it was just not on. We didn't even have microphones in the council chamber so you could actually hear the debate properly. And then the, the, the virus comes along, forces it to happen, and now everyone's engaging with it and, and they can't go back, you know. It's, it's, so there's all these things that have happened by accident. Uh, and there's all these things that are happening by design and the two things are coming together at the moment. And it's, um, it's going to be very interesting this year's elections and looking forward to it. Can't believe I'm saying it. it's great. It's great. It is re that's very positive. And this whole point that you've just discussed is very positive as well. Um, and it's the flip side of the chilling effect that we, you were talking about from defamation and litigation and also from um, harassment of whistleblowers, which is perhaps more of a, you know, federal and state government level thing. Um, although I'm sure there's whistleblowers in local councils too, actually, and I'm sure they get harassed. But um, nevertheless, the point is that there's a, there's a, there's a, um, the, that same phenomena that you're talking about, Kay, within journalism's effect on, um, public institutions also exists um, as a blowback towards journalism from, you know, like the, the, the sort of um, the, the circular effect of, so if, if there's harassment or litigation, um, then that has a chilling effect. So um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's, it's all about the fact that we live in, in societies and what we do mm -hmm. um, has a, a, you know, everything that we do has, a, has an impact and a cause and effect. Um, I, you know, I think most people would agree that the whistleblower um, chilling effect on journalism and so on is a negative effect. Mm. That's a worry at the moment, it's a real worry. Mm. That and I think one of the greatest problems, mm. if I can just throw that in there because you've sort of touched on it, I think one of the greatest problems we face as these little micro operators is, is legal action because mm. uh, I don't have the resources of a News Limited or, a, you know, so I'm much, a, I'm a soft target. And uh, I mentioned before that there was a, you know, a shot across the bows with a story that I was doing where there was a threat of legal action. I had to take the stories down that I'd written and I did that as a, you know, settlement process to just stop the action. Um, but I realised then, I thought, oh, God, that's just now opened the way for another one. <laughs> you know, next time. Yes. That's how it works. So <laughs> next time, um, which happened just a couple of weeks ago, I got a similar, you know, cease and desist. And this time, rightly or wrongly, I said, well, I can't afford to challenge you, so you'll just have to take me on. And I haven't heard anything since. Touch wood. <laughs> so you, that's sometimes... Great. Sometimes it's a, you know, I remember Michael West saying, sometimes you're better off just to shout from the rooftops, this is what's happening. Uh, I'm being sued or I'm about to be sued. And this is why the first time it happened, uh, I had to pay an excess of $2,000, which I just didn't have. So I threw it open to the terriers and all the terriers helped me out to cover the excess. What's that excess? With is that oh, your, sorry, have you got insur defamation insurance or something? I, correct. Yeah, through the mm. union, through the union. But I don't know how many times you can go knocking on the door to say, um, "Could I have that again, please?" So, so the excess for that, yeah, sorry, was for for the for the um, the insurance that mm. covered that. But I could do that once, but then to come back and say, "Well, I'm going to do that again and again and again and again," I could see what was going to happen. I thought I'm becoming, you know, you can shut things down very easily just by threatening. As you know, defamation actions very few of them actually get to court. They're um, often settled before that. So, and yeah, conversely, News Corp will sometimes defend the indefensible, even yeah. though it's costly. Um, yeah. So, so what it, does company structure affect this? The way that you have established the terrier, or, or maybe there's a better way than what you've done, or whatever. But there you know, what, be, what are the yeah. implications of that? Have you thought about that a lot, or? or... I, I, to be honest, I haven't. I, I haven't because I'm one of those terrible people who's hopeless with that sort of side of things. But I realise it's probably something I do need to do is to have a look at how it's structured to separate off my personal self from mm. the business. Um, mm. Must do that mm. this afternoon, actually, on the to-do list because it's <laughs> it's, it's partly that, about you know having a registered company is part of it, isn't it? So that um, yes, you know, with right. ASIC and everything. Um, yes. Yeah. It's complicated. And I thought, mm. okay, but I do need to sort that out because it does leave you vulnerable otherwise. And it's one of the things that, again, I, uh, there's a conversation happening next week about this very topic about how re you know, people in the regions, et cetera, like myself can be protected, you know, to be looked after better, whatever that might mean. Yeah. It's one of the things I intend to raise is how can we, 
how can we help? It's again, how can I get the knowledge to set up that company that you're talking about? Because I wouldn't have a clue. So, well, a friend of mine works for the New South Wales Small Business Something or Other. So, Victoria will probably have an even better version mm-hmm. of that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, that would be where. Yeah. Thank you. Um, they, you they, will, like, they will have training and, 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 and resources. How to do that, yes. Because mm. I've realised that's one of the areas I've left myself a little bit wide open. But um, so far, you know, so far so good, touch wood, that it hasn't come further than that. But I could see that would be a vulnerable spot for when you're just a solo operator, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Anyway. That's, it's, it's, yeah, that's a positive step to take. Um, but the fact that you've got the community... Um, support is awesome so that's a good you know to bring it back mm. to, to to a positive absolutely um, and I think mm. again their awareness of how it works behind the scenes because again most readers never see defamation actions or know what they're all about or mm. what does it, what does, it look, what does the letter look like from the lawyers and I you know I published that stuff and so they can mm. see and yeah. um, again bringing them into the process you know that this is all about this is not a secret anymore journalism not a secret how we operate is not a secret we're going to bring I'm bringing the reader into the whole process really you said and, um, Michael West suggested that. Are you just following him informally or are you looking at various forums where, where people talk about these issues? Or? Yeah, basically I was part of a forum with him uh, that Peter Frey organised, who's now with Crikey. Um, mm. You know Peter, of course. but uh, mm. So he organised a forum which Michael was on and I was on as well just as a, a radio uh, thing. And so he just talked about his experiences with that. So I was busily writing down what he'd... Uh, what he'd suggested <laughs> and it came in very handy at the moment at least so great um, great yeah it's not a bad approach though sometimes just to go on the front foot and see what happens but yes i think getting my company structure in order might be <laughs> worthwhile too for sure well all those things from the um funding support and the moral support the business skills support and the general kind of tips like michael's one mm-hmm. there are things that a hyper local or local independent media network could um facilitate absolutely yep but so maybe that's something that's actually easy for the government to fund because they're not necessarily having to pick hundreds of candidates exactly. from different council areas around australia that's right but if they can kind of fund the model um, centrally, in addition to mm-hmm. funding individuals, um, yep. that that you know is a potential resource. I mean, um, absolutely. I suppose there's risk of duplication there, but I think it's potentially a very useful thing, you know, for training and, mm. and all those things. Mm. Yeah, I think so, and I think that's probably where, as I mentioned before, the ping ping funding was a little bit off centre because it didn't mm. really. It was just sort of very sort of throwing it out there to everybody without really a sense of who was where was what because it's a huge range of people Mm. doing what they're doing yes so something Mm. like that i think would be fantastic and hopefully that's where we're heading yeah okay that's interesting well maybe that's a good area a good point to to leave it as sort of a thought for future action because that's something that maybe universities or um you know other people like that could get involved with or at least do some research that could contribute to it if nothing else absolutely um so that's great any final questions brooke um, I had um, just a quick one, um, and it was to touch on um, something you said just a little bit earlier when you um, said that local media isn't always independent, and they've generally got a bit of a view, and also that Warrnambool is quite a conservative place, and mm. um, the standard is tied up in its advertising model to the council and to big business. Um, did you, when you started, did you know there was an audience out there and did you try to access that audience straight away because we were talking to gail from acm yesterday and she said that um a good way to do is to actually branch out and get a little bit of a following before you start publishing just Mm -hmm. to get an idea of who's reading what and who's interested in what did Mm. you go straight in and look for these big stories and then get a following from your journalism or did you start out Mm. with a little bit of a following that kind of egged you on to those stories Yeah, I think the first, I think it is the first one in the sense that I started out, as I mentioned before, with uh, this Bluestone magazine model um, was to have a a sort of a cross set, like a smorgasbord of stories, pretty, pretty traditional stuff. Like I say, you know, the the softer stories, your colour stories, profiles of people. Um, And then I slotted in these little opinion pieces, as I mentioned, and just to see the responses when we put out an addition to that, how when I say you know, that would come out, started coming out, it was sort of published online only again, which back then was quite radical for Warnable. At the time, the Warnable standard still hadn't gone uh, digital. So 
we would just monitor how you know the readership was and it was always the opinion stories that would shoot off the charts while the other ones were you know they're okay people would read if they knew the person they'd be interested if not less so so the opinion pieces really started to generate the heat and light and I I, I, I sort of Fortunately, just by sheer chance, picked a topic that I didn't realise would sort of divide the community so well, uh, so, so deeply. And then you would know this, uh, Brooke, is that I asked the question, merely asked the question whether or not we, we should shut Flagstaff Hill, our maritime museum, and, and restore the old Fletcher Jones factory, which, you know, on the highway there mm. was all dilapidated and terrible. So this, the piece that I wrote was, you know, Close, close Flagstaff Hill, save Fletcher Jones, just like that. And straight away it was like, oh, you can't say, who, how could you say close Flagstaff Hill? And it turns out, of course, everyone wanted to talk about closing Flagstaff Hill because it was bleeding money, et cetera. So it really started the conversation off. And I managed to get on, a, um, ABC called me up to have a talk about it on radio. And so it just started to generate this momentum. And that's when I took that thread and kept pulling it with a few, you know, there's been a few detours along the way, but... Um, eventually started up the terrier which is purely about those sort of things you know a versus b or what's really going on with this and I, all the soft stuff's completely gone and so it's just <laughs> purely that so yes built a little bit of an audience bit of a following and that was a good solid people knew what the sort of voice i had and in fact when i first started the terrier i started it as carol altman a bit of the oprah winfrey factor i know slightly embarrassing but i just wanted them to know who was behind who was behind the terrier and that then transformed into the terrier. Um, on, funnily enough, from a friend of mine who said, uh, down at UTAS, who's a journo now academic, said, just, just start, just call it the terrier. Because I said, I'm going to call it that next year. She said, don't, don't wait, you know, just do it. So I did it. And I thought, oh, okay. And bang, it just took off. People loved that. They loved the whole, you know, the sort of the, the humour of it, as they say, the terrier. It makes everyone immediately smile because everyone loves dogs and terriers and things, don't they? So yeah. it, it relates to people and, and you can... You know, you can have lots of little fun things around it, like I say, Barry and all the rest of it. So that's a very long-winded way of answering your question. But yes, started off with a little bit of a following, built it up, and then launched into that. Was that, what to expect. that article that you wrote with the Flagstaff Hill Tower, um, you know, the, the, shut the that down Hill, Fletcher Jones? Fletcher Jones, um, yeah. Was that a happy accident or was that something that you did deliberately to stir up a little bit of controversy to, to kind of jumpstart a readership? Yeah, I think probably that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that. I mean, I think it was something very close to my heart because I could see poor old Fletcher Jones's factory was just dying, and it was such an iconic, beautiful place in Warrnambool. Has it? Yeah, you know, she. For people who don't know, it's got these magnificent gardens at the front, and it's you know, it's the sort of entrance to Warrnambool. A lot of nostalgia about it. Um, the state that that was in, I just couldn't believe it, and and yet we were pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars into this recreated. You know, colonial village and so I knew that this would be something that would have uh, people would have a strong opinion on so yeah I jumped straight in and I took a very strong you know as I said I didn't go oh here's maybe what we could do and here's but it was just like do this or do that what do you think and it got everyone talking and um, oh it was it was one of those stories you know it sort of is shared like a couple of hundred times and you can't believe it it's one of those ones that just took off I could imagine really, it would have been, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you know the funny thing is here we are what are we, 2020, and there's a story in the paper today, should we keep Flagstaff Hill? I mean, mm. oh my God. <laughs> I saw that, yeah, I saw the figure and I thought, surely, we, like, we're only a small town, can we afford Flagstaff Hill? Yeah, yeah. When, I was, when I was writing about it, it was losing 400,000, now it's losing 800,000. Yeah. Anyway, we'll pick that one up next year, I think. Yeah. Oh my God, what a case study in um, so many things from journalism to council yeah, but... mismanagement to well, community discussions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. become like, the, it's become almost the, you know, I don't know, the touchstone to the terrier is how's Flagstaff Hill coming along, everybody? <laughs> 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 Gee, look at those figures. Oh, it's <laughs> crazy. It's become, every time I bring it up, there's almost a groan, but I like, yeah, I'm sorry, I have to keep mentioning it because the good thing is we have saved Fletcher Jones, courtesy of a mm. wonderful philanthropic person who's come in and bought that. But poor old, poor old Flagstaff Hill. I mean, I'm sorry to say. Anyway, I'll let you know how that goes in 2030. It might have closed by then. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll tune in and let you know. <laughs> $800,000 a year loss. Wow, that's huge. That's um, huge. Well, um, that's, why, that's why it resonated as an issue, partly. 
quite resonated because yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a substantial thing. You know, it's not a little thing. Um, well, thank you so much, Carol. Oh no, thank you. It's been great to chat, and you've given me mm. some food for thought as well, which is always a wonderful thing when you have one of these forums. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad to hear that, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And um, I'm going to stop the recording now. But thank you, um, Carol Altman from the Terrier, and thanks uh, Kay and Brooke for coming along too. And great questions. And bye bye. So the recording.